So welcome back. We're in Genesis chapter 3, just the very end of it. Okay. So let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, you have made man and woman uh, to be the, the crown of your creation. You have bestowed upon man your image, which was lost in the fall. And yet in your Son, Christ, you return it to us by faith. Strengthen then that faith in, in us by your word, that we may come not only to know you, but to trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So I think, I think we're ready for verse 20. Genesis 3.20. Genesis 3.20. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Okay, so... Again, we've talked about headship being an important part of the Bible in general, but especially the story of Adam and Eve. Remember, Adam was given headship over creation. He was given stewardship over it. He exercises that by naming the animals. When you name something, you are exercising authority over that thing. So... You know, the, the old estates would have a name that the, that the Lord of the manor would give to it, right? Um, and, parents, we name our children. Why? They're our children. That's an exercise of authority over them, right? So Adam gives Eve her name. This is Adam exercising his headship over Eve. Now, what does the name Eve mean? Um, if, if any of you remember the old musical Fiddler on the Roof, the word here is Chava. Yeah. In Latin, Natalie. Yup. Right? Natal, Natus, born, life, living. We get the word nation from this. Right? A nation is a, is a people that comes from one person. So like the, the, the race of man or the nation of mankind comes from Adam the man. right? So Eve is the mother of all the living ones. Yeah, all, all of those who are going to come are going to come from her. And remember, what was the promise given to Adam and Eve, albeit spoken as a curse to the, ser to the serpent? Your seed, the, or the, the, sorry, the woman's seed is going to crush the serpent's head, right? So, so the, the, the one who crushes Satan's head is going to come from the woman. Okay. Just file that one away for later. And look at verse 21. Remember, as soon as Adam and Eve rec realized that they were naked... They made garments for themselves, right? God didn't make them garments. They made themselves garments out of fig leaves, fig leaves right? Which is as laughable then as it is now. Leaves are horrible clothing. Um, especially fig leaves. Especially fig leaves, yeah. It's just, it's right, it's, it's ridiculous. But again, that they made them for themselves is notable, because what are they trying to do? They are trying to hide. They're trying to cover their own sin, right? Remember David in Psalm 32 says, I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin, right? The whole concept of righteousness by faith versus righteousness by works is a major, major theme, not only of the whole Bible, but especially Genesis 3 and 4. You're going to see it very clearly in the next chapter. But they, hide, they try to hide themselves, right? And guess what? Doesn't work. But now what does God do in verse 21? 
He makes garments for them, right? God covers them. God covers their nakedness. Ideally, man wouldn't be naked at all or, or wouldn't be ashamed of being naked because we would be righteous before God. However, now that sin has entered the world, now that man is naked and is conscious of that, or conscious of that and is ashamed of it as we should be because now we're sinners, one, it, establishes, it, it, it does in a way establish that's why we wear clothing because there now is such a thing as shame. However, the bigger thing is, note where the clothing comes from, God makes it for them. That wasn't just a nice thing he did, that's to indicate the kind of relationship God is going to have with man. He will provide for them, even after the fall into sin. So God does not cut off man and say, you had your chance, you made your bed, mankind, now lie in it. He doesn't do that. The first thing he does is he promises an enemy that's going to crush the serpent's head. The next thing he does, he's going to make clothing, right? You Germans might call this lederhosen, right? Leather pants. Um, he's going to take animal skins, which means something else. If mankind is going to stand before God and live unashamed, blood is going to have to be shed. That theme is not going away anytime soon in the Bible, right? Not the last time this is going to happen at all. Matter of fact, it's going to happen again in the next chapter. The idea that because of sin, now blood is going to have to be shed. And whatever animal it was that gave his life to become a, a, a garment for the man and the woman, now creation knows because man sinned, we're, we're now at risk. It's one of the reasons why animals aren't always that fond of us. But this is the first shedding of blood. This is the first shedding of blood, yes. This is the first time blood is shed, not by any stretch the last. And it was done as an act of mercy to cover the man and the woman. That's weird. No, God totally killed that animal. Good grief. The footnotes in here are really mostly pretty good, but every now and then you catch one and you go, what were you thinking? But, all right. Now look at verse 22. Again, God is speaking and he's using us. Right? Now why the ESV did not, at least in my version, capitalize the word us, I don't know. Because who is us? The Trinity, yes. This... I don't know, but it's, it's, it's a pronoun for God, right? Because don't we normally do like you and he and stuff? Him, right. Yeah, yeah, the King James just doesn't. And, and I'd like it if it were consistent. Like if you're going to capitalize and capitalize them, and if you're not, don't. No, in, in verse 22, in knowing good and evil. Oh, okay. So man was... Man was created to be like God in possessing original righteousness, that is, in being holy, in being morally good. Now, man is like God in knowing good and evil. Remember, that, that was the temptation. God's holding out on you. There's stuff he's not telling you. Well, what was it? It was evil. That's what they didn't have any knowledge of, was evil. Because they already knew good. God made them good. Now they also know evil. Okay, so then, God, then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the Tree of Life. All right, so why did Adam and Eve have to be expelled from the Garden? So they would not eat from the Tree of Life. Doesn't that seem backward to us? 
Shouldn't it be that they are forbidden from eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil again? Right. So what was the promise? For those who ate of the tree of life, they would live forever. So in, yeah, so in expelling them from the garden, they're not going to live forever, not on this, not on this earth anyway. Yeah, <clears throat> have you ever spent any time talking to someone who's made it to 100 years or older? It's, it's very common for them to express an attitude of, I'm tired of the ugliness in the world. I'm tired of the pain. Not just my joints creaking. I'm tired of the, the moral pain of seeing so many people hurting. And they're tired of, their, of losing their friends. They're tired of the world being unrecognizable to them from what they grew up in. And they're not wrong in saying that. The world is a vastly different place than it was 100 years ago. Um, they're, they're, yes, this is the wages of sin. The wages of sin is death. And God promised them, in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. And so they did. They're expelled from the garden, in which case they are now subjected to death. That didn't mean they stopped breathing that very day, but in the day you eat of it, you're now subjected to death. You're now mortal. However, as, as Reverend Schwizo pointed out, um, there is a blessing here in that living forever would be itself a kind of a curse. In that you have to see all of this and there's no end to it. You have to see all of the pain, all of the destruction, all of the, all of the effects of sin with no relief. All right. Genesis chapter 4. Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. All right, let's unpack this a little bit. She she Ch chap yeah. Chapter 4 is going to establish a number of precedents that will follow us throughout the scriptures. First of all, the command given to marriage, be fruitful, multiply, that's what's going on here at the beginning of chapter 4. Adam knew his Eve his wife. That is to say, they, um, they, they were married. She conceived and bore Cain. That's going to be the pattern then for married life, right? That the, that the husband and wife know one another and they conceive and bear children. The first of these is named Cain, right? And Cain means possession. He's mine. Right. <clears throat> I know we've talked about this before, but just as a reminder, very few of the English translations capture this nuance very well. But in the Hebrew, it seems pretty clear that what Eve thinks happened is more than just God helped her have a baby. Because what she says is, I have begotten a, or I, yeah, I've, I've begotten a man the Lord. There's a, there's a little particle in Hebrew that could mean with the help of or a direct object. And <clears throat> I think it's fairly clear it should be the second one, that is, that Eve thinks she gave birth to Jesus. Why did Eve think she gave birth to Messiah? Because God gave her a promise. Your seed is going to crush the serpent's head. Here's her seed. Okay, do it. Now, spoilers. Cain is not the Messiah. However, she wasn't wrong either. Because at least she believed the promise. So even though Eve is a sinner, and we know that she is, God pronounces curses upon her because of her sin as well as Adam and the serpent. Even though she is a sinner, she is nonetheless a Christian. That is to say, she believes in the promise given that God will crush the serpent and death. And so even though she's about 42 generations too early, the idea is sound that her seed will crush the serpent's head. 
And so she gives thanks to God saying, I've, I've gotten a man, the Lord. Yeah, yeah. In other words, she, she knew that her seed would be the Lord. And you'll see evidence of this in the Old Testament. I mean, the, the clearest one in my mind is in Ezekiel 34, when the Lord has spent several chapters chastising the shepherds of Israel, that is, the, the kings of the people. And he says, I myself will do it. I myself will be their shepherd. And then here stands a man in John 10 and says, I am the good shepherd. In other words, he's saying, I'm the Lord. And by the way, the Pharisees picked up what he was laying down. It's pretty cool, though, that he's called. Yeah, and this is the thing. As we can go on and on about, oh, Adam and Eve, what, how much better would creation have been if they hadn't, as though we wouldn't have done the same thing. But, but the fact is, she's the mother of the living, not only in a sense that she's genetically our ancestor, but she's an example of faith. That is, she stands before the Lord righteous because she has faith. Now, look at verse 2. Again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. Genesis 4, chapter, or verse 2. Moses doesn't say that she conceived and bore Abel. Moses says she conceived and bore Cain, and then she bore Abel. This has led some commentators to say, and, and all we can do is speculate, because we're not specifically told, but it's possible that what's indicated here is that they were twins. Because sometimes it happens when you think you're going to have child number five, and in reality, there are children five and six. Just throwing that out there. Sometimes these things happen. Now, this is going to be children one and two for them, probably. So now they have two brothers, and Abel means what? Vanity. Abel means vanity. Almost as though Eve is kind of, you know, Adam and Eve are, are kind of tired of the, the vanity of life in a sinful world. That's the, kind of, that's the kind of name that like the Puritans would give to their children. If you ever do genealogy and you find the Puritans, they're given names like this. Tem yeah, temperance, right? Okay, so verse 2, again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Okay, so the, the brothers are, they, they have work that they do. This is an established pattern. What, is, what does Cain do for a living? He's a farmer. What's Abel do for a living? He's a shepherd, right? <laughs> a sheep rancher? Is, is, that, a, is that a word? <clears throat> One word in English, make it yes. He's a, he's, a, he's a sheep herder or a shepherd. <clears throat> not, not the last time we're going to see innocent shepherds in the Bible either, by the way. The Lord, the, the Lord really has kind of a soft, tender heart for people who keep sheep. And he also really has a not tender heart for those who do it badly. Uh, again, read the, the prophet Ezekiel. <clears throat> now, which of these is a better job? <laughs> the, there are bad questions, aren't there? Right? So it's, it's not that one had the better job before the Lord, right? It's not that, well, you know, 
this job was better, that job wasn't, and therefore one had favor, one didn't. There's, there's no hint of that in the text. Which one is necessary? Both, right? Both are necessary. Okay. <clears throat> now, one of the things that, that we see is that they're bringing offerings before the Lord. This is even before the, the, the sacrifices are commanded in Moses. Because we're still many, many, many generations away from Moses even being born. <clears throat> but they know that part of their life before God is offering sacrifice. Notice that the sacrifice comes from what God has given them. Right? So, Cain works the ground. He's going to take some of what comes from the ground. Abel tends the sheep. He's going to give from his flock. Which offering is better? They would be the same if they were done right. That's the correct answer. Yeah. Yeah, and so, so what we have to distinguish is how are they different, right? Excellent. Did everyone hear that? <clears throat> that Moses notes when Abel gives from his flock, he doesn't just give from his flock. He gives of the first fruit of the flock. Cain, we're not told that. Cain just gives from the fruit of the ground. Yeah, not, not, just the, not just the firstborn, but the fat portions. And the fat portions are, that's where the flavor is, right? In other words, that's, just, that's the stuff that, if you wanted to keep any back for yourself, that's the part you would keep back for yourself, right? Because that's the best. Abel, however, does not keep back the fat portions for himself. That's what he gives to the Lord. It's not because it's the 1980s and everyone's telling him that fat is bad. It's rather because he knows it's the best and he wants to give the best to the Lord. In other words, why does Abel give what he gives? Yes. Now, how do we know the distinction is between faith and unbelief? Now we go to Hebrews 11. I had a, I had a Bible reference for Eve, and it just it slipped my mind. It happens. <clears throat> yeah, four sounds right. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. So here we're given the answer. Why was Abel's sacrifice accepted and Cain's was not? Because we're told in Hebrews 4, by faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God, commended him, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. We'll get to that part in just a second. So the distinction between Cain and Abel was not, um, you know, one sacrifice was itself better than another. Rather, Abel offered his in faith. And that's what God commended him for. So guess what other theme Genesis 4 introduces for us? <clears throat> that there is a relationship between faith and works. That on the one hand... You cannot put works in where faith goes. We are not righteous before God because of our works. We're righteous before God because of our faith. However, that faith will manifest itself in a visible way, such that Abel, who believed, brings of his fat portions and the firstborn, and Cain, who does not, brings just whatever from the ground. Yes. Right. Yeah. Faith is what made the widow's might. Such, such a great thing, because she had little, but of the little that she had, she gave. Right. 
But the idea is that God judges sacrifices. So the, the sacrifice is not just going up to the winds to be, you know, whatever. God judges sacrifices. He either accepts them or he doesn't. By the way, this is extremely good news for you because you as Christians have placed your entire eternal future into the hands of the truth of a sacrifice, right? By being here, by praying to God, by being Christians, you indicate, you believe that your future is resting upon the validity of the sacrifice of the Son of God on the cross. How do you know God accepted that sacrifice? He's risen from the dead. God raised him from the dead to show that sacrifice was acceptable to him. That's why Good Friday and Easter are not really to be separated. They're, they're, they're parts of the same story. Christ died, he makes the sacrifice. He's raised from the dead to indicate God accept that sacrifice, and now death has in fact been crushed exactly according to God's promise. Yeah, the, the, the implication here is that had Cain believed, even though he's giving something different than Abel would, God would accept that sacrifice, right? It's, it's not what he gave was bad. It's that he didn't give in faith, right? Which also means that the same action done by two people might outwardly look exactly the same. And yet God, seeing all things, knows that, that they're wildly different, right? One can give, for example, so that he can be seen and be, be you know, rewarded by men. Look at what a good person this is. The other could give because he believes, right? That's a distinction only God can see. Verse 8, Cain spoke to Abel his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Okay, stop on there for just a second at the end of verse 12. When it says Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, put on your, your literary helmet here for a second. What kind of speech was this? He's starting an argument. He's starting something with his brother, right? So it's not just Hey, Abel, nice weather we're having. He's, he's wanting to give a cause to rise up against Abel and kill him. Right? So they're in the field. Cain kills Abel. By what means? Doesn't say. But he does. <clears throat> and then immediately what happens? God asks the question, where's your brother? And again, just like Adam, Adam, where are you? It's not that God doesn't know. He's, omnip he's, not, he's omniscient. What's he doing? Absolutely. Yep. God's going to demand an account for the sin. What have you done? God doesn't overlook sin. He can't. He's holy. But in asking, there's opportunity for Cain to, to come clean. And to repent, right? But what does he say? What a little... What a worm... I don't know, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you are. I mean, was there ever a verse that cried out for more resounding, yes, you fool? But there we are, right? Am I my brother's keeper? 
Yes, you are. And that verse has been repeated in Corinthians. Right. And of course, it's used and misused both. And this is, this is by no means the only time in the Bible when you have this. For example, King David. Right? When the, when the prophet confronts him, there was a man who had a little sheep. You are the man. And what does David do? He repents. And he's restored. And even better one, Peter and Judas. Which of those two betrayed Jesus? Both. They both betrayed and denied Jesus. However, Peter confesses and is restored. Judas murders himself and despairs. I mean, Judas has at least contrition. He tries to give back the silver, right? But he doesn't. He doesn't confess. In other words, he doesn't believe that there's forgiveness for this. He tries to make it right by giving the money back, as though that somehow puts the blood back in Jesus' skin. Peter, on the other hand, again, not necessarily the best confession in the whole wide world, but he confesses. You know that I love you. So, it's, it's not even necessarily the magnitude of the sin that keeps one from God. It's unbelief. Because Peter's sin was great. David's sin was great. Adam and Eve's sin was great. But they confess, and they're, they're given the promise, right? Cain, however, he digs in his heels. What am I, my brother's keeper? In other words, he's, he's denying the law. He's trying to argue with God about how the law works. Good luck. God doesn't play those games about loopholes. I mean, for one thing, he knows the heart. You can't play the loophole lawyer game with God because he knows what you're up to. He knows everything you've done. He knows what your heart is after. And he's the one who wrote the law. So when, when, when he's got you cornered, the only option is confess. But Cain doesn't do that. So the Lord asks, what have you done? Again, rhetorical. And he says, the voice of your brother's blood is crying from the ground. In other words, there's an imbalance. There's something not right that God will make right. right? Your, your brother's blood is crying out. What's it crying out for? Vengeance. Now, the verse in the Bible about vengeance is mindset, the Lord I will repay, is usually used to discourage people from being vigilantes, which, whatever. But <clears throat> it does mean that vengeance belongs to the Lord. And the Lord will avenge those who are murdered, like Abel. The Lord will repay. And given what we know of the Lord's punishment, that's probably a worse fate than if a mob had gotten a hold of him. Because that's what Cain is worried about, right? <clears throat> well, if I'm just going to wander the earth, someone's going to grab me and murder me. If you think that's bad, imagine what hell is. And that's, that's, that's not a call for us to do nothing in the face of injustice. But <clears throat> sometimes, you know, you're, you're slandered, you're stolen from, and that's, that's all that's left. But among the many blessings that come on the last day is that all that have been lied about, sinned against, um, made victims will be vindicated. So Cain is given a curse beyond what Adam has. Now instead of the earth bearing fruit with thorns and with toil and sweat, now for Cain the earth is what? It's not going to give up anything. So now, instead of Cain working the ground, Cain is going to have to search and wander for food. <clears throat> Verse 13. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. 
and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, the Lord put a um, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Okay, so Cain's response is what? Imagine what repentance is and then think of the opposite. He's complaining about the injustice of the punishment. My punishment is greater than I can bear. Even as his brother is dead, Cain's first thought is to himself. I can't take this punishment. What a worm. Cain is a, Cain is a wicked man. <clears throat> you know, there's, there's no sorrow over the fact that his own brother is dead. And by the way, have you noticed how many times Moses describes Abel as my brother, my brother? Why does Moses keep repeating the fact that, that Abel was Cain's brother? It shows how horrible this was. It's, I mean, it, it's not just a murder, which is bad. He's murdering his own brother, which is bad and worse. And yeah, and Cain just doesn't, he just does not seem bothered by this. His first thought is, I can't bear this punishment. Yeah, yeah, we covered that. But yeah, you're right, because that, that's what Eve says. Yeah, and, and even if they are twins, the firstborn thing still applies. It doesn't make any sense, but it is very real. Um, there is definitely one that's older than the other, and they remember it. Speaking from experience. Well, the only people that are going to be that are going to be able to hurt him are going to be his own brothers and sisters. Because we're not, we're not told that Adam and Eve have more children, but almost certainly they're going to. Yeah, and, and, and what's, what's Cain worried about? I might get murdered by my brother. Gee, Cain. Why do you think that might be a problem, Cain? So a mark is placed on Cain. Okay, I don't know about that. Yeah, I do too, but we're not told. So um, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, but... That, that, that is all I have, because we're, we're told he puts a mark on Cain. We're not told what the mark is, um, that, that people know. Uh, yeah, but we, but we don't know what, what the nature of it is. And this, <clears throat> if you know much about Mormon history, you'll know speculation can lead you into some horrible and weird places, um, which is why we, we should try not to speculate where the Bible doesn't just explicitly say, or we can make a reasonable, you know. Because, yeah, we're, we're just told the Lord puts a mark on him, whatever it is. And then Cain goes away from the presence of the Lord. That's not just a, he moved geographically. That is a spiritual state. He moved from the presence of the Lord. In other words, his unbelief led to impenitence, his impenitence led him away from God, where we kind of assume he remained. <clears throat> and we're going to have to take up the sons of Cain next week. Let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you.